Thomas. Uh, we're glad to have you with us today. Uh, if we were joining today in service, this is the fifth week in the month, and on those months we normally have a, a special family worship service, and the young people and the teens would have been involved in lots of different ways, so uh, I guess uh, young people and kids, uh, as you're watching this this morning, maybe there's something you can do or you've seen together as a family. Anyways, we miss you, we love you, we appreciate you young people and the kids, and we just want to share that and let you know. Um, so this is two weeks in, and uh, of course it's affected all of our lives. Uh, someday when we come back together, or we're going to have a chance to talk about all the, th all the ways that it impacted us, all the adjustments we had to make. Uh, my prayer is that we'll have a lot of blessings to share, a lot of ways that God has uh, just shown himself to be awesome and, and big and transformative in our families and in our life. We are in the Gospel of John, and we are in chapter 13, so I want to invite you to follow along. Uh, we're going to be reading from that chapter, so um, get your cup of coffee, have your Bible with you, have a notebook, a pen, and um, just write down some thoughts, however the Lord may prompt you, and uh, let's come to His Word together. Lord, just bless Your Word to our hearts, uh, we pray this morning, in Jesus' name, amen. So we're in John 13, I want to read the text, and, and then we'll come back and we'll look at it. Beginning in verse 31, John writes these words. When he had gone out, he's referring to Judas there. Judas has now left the upper room. Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, Where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterward. And Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, Will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. We come to this chapter, we come to this book. Uh, it is all about Christ. We're meeting, we're meeting a God the Father through the person of Christ. And, um, and so face to face, we just have that, that real relationship. The Lord now, he's coming to the end of his ministry. In this narrative, in the text, it's Thursday night. He's going to be crucified tomorrow on Friday. And uh, he's spending this last evening in the upper room with his disciples. Now Judas has left to betray him. And now Jesus uh, gives the remainder of his focus um, to his 11 disciples. What we see today is just is this, uh, as, we're, as we're here in John 13, we see um, what Jesus is going to remind us as he finishes his ministry here. What, what, is it, what is most important that the disciples catch before he leaves and goes to be with, the, uh, with his Father? What's the most important thing? Well, he's, he's, in this last message through chapter 14, he's condensing all of those things. And he hits on three significant items this morning, and I want to I want to look at that. So let's uh, let's begin, and let's look at uh, some of these these three things together. So let's look in John. The first thing is this: Jesus reminds us that uh, everything He's doing, and everything that we should do in our life too, as a child of God, as a believer, is is to live for the glory of God, is to honor God in in everything that we do. All we have to do is look at the, at the life of Christ and how he finishes here to see that's exactly what he did. In verse 31 and 32, uh, John writes these words, when he had gone out, now this verse 31 and 32 says, the Son of Man is glorified. God is glorified in him. And if God is glorified in him, he will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. The whole goal here is, is that God would get the glory. His Father would receive the glory. And as He is committed to that, in the same way, He is receiving glory from His Father and being glorified. And together, 
uh, as a part of the Godhead. They are, they are receiving and giving glory as the mission to which he was sent is now being fulfilled in Christ. Um, everything that, that Jesus has done has been for the Father. As he's spoken, as he's administered, he says, I have come to, to speak the words of the Father. I have come to do the works of the Father. Every moment, every day, every step has been led by and in, uh, in submission to the will of his Father. He's finishing with that goal in mind to, to, to honor his Father to the very end and in turn being fully honored by his Father for what he's done. But how does he do this? What's, how does he honor his Father? Well, we could look at a lot of, a lot of different ways. I just, want to, I just want to put one thought in front of you this morning. John chapter 17, verse 4, Jesus says this, I have glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. Jesus says, my Father is being honored now because in every way and in every moment, I have done exactly what the Father has asked me to do. I have done it uh, uh, on task. I have done it with my heart fully His. I have done it with no hesitation. I have done it um, with a passion and a desire to honor the Lord in everything that I've done. You know, word would be that way too. The Lord, as He as He saves us and puts His call into our life, He says to every every believer, "Your goal now is to live your life so that God would be honored. Your goal is to do the work that He has you to do." You know, every one of us are very very unique. Kids, young people, those who are who are old, all of us still have a path that God has us on, and that path is filled with. Uh, with uh, steps of obedience, uh, duty, blessings, opportunities, challenges, trials, and all of those things are so that we can honor the Lord with every choice and every decision. Jesus was committed to this, and he says to all of us, that, that must be your commitment too uh, as a child of God. And so my prayer is, even as we begin to walk through this text, that that's your, that's your passion, that's your heartbeat. Say, Lord... It is you I want to honor. Lord, it is you I want to obey. Whatever I'm doing in my life, may I accomplish those things. As we move into this text and through it, we, we see that they, um, they encounter uh, confusion in their hearts as the Lord continues. Um, he's, he says some things here, and they don't know how to respond, how to, how to process it. In verse 33, Jesus says, uh, little children, by the way, that's just a term of, of endearment. It is a term, of, it's, it does recognize their need for further growth and maturity and, and that we never arrive until we're with the Lord one day. But it is a term also just of affection that he has for them and love for them. Little children, yet a little while I'm with you, and you will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going you cannot come. He had said this a, a, a couple of different times in, in his previous ministry to the Jewish leaders and he was indicating there they could not go to heaven to be with him because they did not have a relationship with him. He's going to add another element here. In verse 36, we move down to verse 36, Simon Peter responds to what the Lord has said. Verse 34 and 35 have, have the core of this passage. But all that Simon Peter can think about, all that the disciples can think about is what Jesus has just said. And so, and so Peter responds in verse 36, and he says, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow me afterward. You know, you know, Peter's just like us. He just wants to know the answer. He's like your kids who are always asking questions. Uh, why? Why can't, why? Why do we tell them to do something? Why can't I? You can't do this. Why? And, and we get that, and after a while, it's just kind of like, whoa, right? Peter's the same way, and he, he just speaks what's in his heart, but he just, it just comes out. Why can't I, why can't I go? Why can't I follow you? And in fact, uh, Peter then says this in verse 37. Um, he just verbalizes it. We see that his intentions, his intentions are good. Peter wants to go be with the Lord. He wants to follow the Lord. Uh, all the disciples know that Jesus is, is facing death. He has, he has a, he has a, uh, he's a wanted man in Jerusalem. Um, he knows that the authorities are looking to, to take him and to kill him. They know that. And so Peter doesn't want to miss that. He wants to be with the Lord. His heart is right. Uh, his intentions are right. 
And then he says this, verse 37, Peter says, I, I will lay down my life for you. You know, you just can't say it any stronger. You can't say it any better uh, than that. You know, all of us have been here. Uh, every child of God has been here. Every year when we make New Year's resolutions, if we do that, we're, we're laying good intentions before the year. Uh, we say, you know, I'm going to be, I'm going to be more faithful in in reading God's word. I'm going to be more faithful in praying. I'm going to be more faithful in sharing uh, a witness to my friends and my neighbors. I'm going to be, I'm going to be, uh, uh, I'm going to make changes in my life. I'm going to quit doing this. You know what? We are. I'm going to, um, I'm going to serve. I'm going to, I'm going to reach out to this person or that person. You know what? Our, all of our lives are filled with good intentions that have just been strewn along the, uh, the path. And those good intentions are awesome and they're great. But they, they, they reveal a weakness that we all have and just the, the weakness of our flesh. And Peter, you know, he just says it. You can't, you can't say it any better than this. Lord, I, I did, I'd lay my life down for you. And in this moment, that's exactly his heart's intent. Folks, we cannot, we cannot fault him for expressing that. Jesus answers in the same verse. He says, well, Peter, really? Will you lay down your life for me? Jesus knows the answer to that. Both answers to that we're going to get to. When Jesus goes to the cross, Peter's not going to be anywhere. Um, in fact, this is what Jesus says in verse 38. He says, truly, Peter, Peter, here's the truth. The rooster will not crow until you have denied me three times. I, I, can't, I can't imagine... You know, the disciples are there listening to this conversation, too. I can't imagine how crushing those words would have been to hear. Uh, what, what, what goes through Peter's heart right then and there? Uh, he, has just, he has just made himself vulnerable and said, Lord, I would, I would die for you. And, and the Lord says, no, not only are you not going to die for me, you're going to deny me. You're not going to just do it once. You're going to do it three times. Um, my heart would have, my heart in that situation would have gone so, so cold and so, I would have been so ashamed. Uh, I can't even imagine what Peter's feeling right here. I know what the Lord's feeling in the sense of he's going to the cross because of his love for Peter and those disciples. And he's going to love Peter through that failure. I tell you what, aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that the Lord has loved us and loves us through our failures? And that's what the gospel is all about. When sin has wrecked our lives and we have failed over and over again, Jesus went to the cross to save us, to provide salvation. As a child of God, continually by His grace, He He forgives us when we when we confess, and He and He washes us, and He and He picks us up from our failures. Let's just take a glimpse into the future, just a second. Peter is not going to follow through here in what he just said, but in John chapter twenty one, we see these words. Jesus says to Peter, Peter, when you are old, you are going to stretch out your hands. And another person, another, will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. Jesus said to Peter, you're going to die, and you're going to die for me. You will fulfill this commitment that you made, but it's not going to be now when I go to the cross. It's going to be later when you finish your ministry. You're going to die a horrible death. Tradition tells us that he was crucified as Christ was, but upside down. Because he refused to be crucified in the same manner as Christ. He wasn't worthy. And he had betrayed Christ. But Jesus says when Peter dies his death, he's going he's gonna to bring honor to his father. That's really encouraging. I'm sure Peter had to uh, be encouraged by those words. Because Peter simply wanted to make a difference for the Lord. And to hear the Lord say this, man, what grace, even, even, in, a, even in a horrible prophecy, for Peter, you're going to die this way. There was the grace that Peter would be used for the Lord when he died. And Peter, Peter embraced that. In fact, Jesus finishes these verses right here and he says this. After saying this, he said to Peter, follow me. You know what? Peter could have shied away here in this chapter from that. and says, I'm, I'm not willing to pay that price. I'm not willing to do that. But you know what? Peter's already established here in this chapter 13. Lord, I would die for you. He failed at those words when Jesus went to the cross. But you know what? He kept his word. When it really mattered in his testimony down the road, he took these words right here in verse 19 seriously. And he says, when Jesus said, follow me, Peter says, I'm there. And that's how Peter finished. P Peter, Peter finished well. That's really neat. 
And Jesus says, where I'm going, you cannot come now, but you will follow me later. Just look at these words in John 14, 3. You know, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. I will take you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That's, that's one of the greatest comforts to every family who is a child of God. When we, when we walk through death's door and step into glory with, with our Savior, these are some of the most powerful words. These are words that say, you know what, Jesus is coming again. When the rapture occurs, he's going to bring his family home to be with him. Um, I just lost a niece this last week. Young, a young lady, and she's with the Lord right now. And these words have been fulfilled. That is a joy. Okay, here's another thought. Here's what's significantly important in our life. We're to love others. That's the whole point of this passage. And we're to love like Christ. We're to love like Him. Verse 34, as we go back to verse 34, remember they kind of missed this. They were so captivated by not being able to go follow the Lord that they missed really the, the core of what Jesus is saying here. They would learn it, they would understand it, they would come back to this, and it's going to change their life. In this moment, they're struggling to assimilate the reality of these two verses. Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Um, now, if you know your Bible at all, you look at your study notes in your Bible that you have right there, um, it's clear that this commandment that Jesus gives isn't brand new. Uh, it's been in the Scriptures, it's rooted and grounded in the Scriptures. Okay, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, God tells us we're to love our God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our might. Um, that is the call of every child every uh, child of Israel, every child of God. Uh, we are to love Him uh, like that. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, we're to love our neighbor as ourself. Why? Because I am the Lord. Uh, these, this commandment that Jesus gives here in John 13 is rooted in the law, in the Old Testament. It is not new. What is new is this. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And Jesus says, here's, here's the key, here's the transformation. Not just knowing about love, not just, just seeing it in the scriptures, but seeing it in a way you've never, ever seen it before. Love is, is being demonstrated by God, through God, in the flesh, in, in an environment of sinful people. And Jesus has just served the disciples by washing their feet. Peter says, Lord, you're never going to wash my feet. Jesus corrected him, but Jesus served him. Jesus loved him and all the 12 disciples. Judas was there. Jesus washed Judas' feet in love and with the opportunity for grace. He loved the disciples who had just previously been arguing about who's the greatest, who's going who's gonna to have the highest peg in the, in the ladder, the, have the top honors. And um, Jesus loves them to the very end. He loves them perfectly when they don't deserve it. He, he loved me, he loves you when we don't deserve it. That's the kind of love that he's showing here. Uh, so let's look. What are some of the ways that Jesus showed this love? Just briefly. Romans chapter 5, we see this. God showed his love for us while we were still sinners. Christ loved us. He died for us. When we were weak, incapable, unable, he died for us. When we were, in, in fact, enemies of God, like Judas... He died for us. Um, he loved us sacrificially. He paid the highest cost. He gave, the, he gave every opportunity for grace to take hold in our hearts. You know that Jesus loves you this morning? And he loves you with grace that is so powerful it goes with you to your last refusal. If you choose to refuse Christ, his grace will go with you to that last refusal, not letting up. If you're a believer this morning and you're a child of God, do you realize how, how good that news is in your life? Do you realize how transformative that has to be in our lives? We must aspire to loving like Christ and, uh, and being passionate about loving people like the Lord did. This world is filled with difficult people just like me, and the Lord loved me. We have to make every effort to yield to the work of the Spirit so that we can love, so that we can have the impact towards others that Christ desired for us. He loves us when we were in this place. Not only that, not only uh, 
We come to John 13, we see this, that he loved us by serving us. He served us with absolute humility. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, ye you should also wash one another's feet. You remember, he's, he's king. I mean, he's, he's exalted king. He is Lord of lords and king of kings. He is the creator of the universe. One day he will fully be exalted. We will, we will bow before him uh, with no words to say but honor and praise. And um, and this is the this is the this is our Savior, who who simply bowed before his disciples not to worship them, but to serve them. He humbled himself to serve them. Their feet were dirty, their lives were dirty. They weren't perfectly clean. They had a relationship with Christ, except for Judas, and yet he served. He served Judas, who was dirty through and through. He was filled with sin through and through. He didn't deserve grace. The disciples didn't deserve grace. We don't deserve grace. And yet Jesus humbly bows to serve us by giving us his life. He gave his life for us. Uh, that is costly. And then in Luke 17, we see these words. Um, this is about forgiveness. If someone sins against you seven times in a day and turns to you seven times, saying, I repent, you must forgive him. There's other passages that expound upon this, but, but in this passage it's significant. The apostles then say to Jesus after this, they said, Lord, increase our faith. They looked at themselves and said, we can't do this. We can't love people like this. You know, this is one of the hard places to love people is to forgive those who have really, truly hurt us deeply and wounded us, who have said things we'll never forget, who have acted in ways toward us we'll never forget. Jesus says we're to forgive. When he went to the cross, he forgave all sin, all offenses against himself to those who would come to him in faith and, and, and ask him to be their savior and to forgive their sins. He offered cleansing. He offered a new life. He offers a change, a, a transformation of our lives. That's the kind of savior he is. And he reminds us that if we're going to love like him, we need to be willing to forgive. Mark chapter 6, verse 34 when Jesus went ashore and when he saw the crowds, he was moved with compassion because he saw, he saw all of these crowds. He saw this crowd as people who were like sheep without a shepherd. He knows in this world we're wandering. We're just wandering. Every person, when we're born, we are just wandering, looking for meaning, looking for value. With this coronavirus going on, what is looking? Maybe the things that have been mattered to me in my life have been taken away. If I'm a sports fanatic, I have no sports. That's a change in my life. I've, I've lost the ability to go here, to go there, to travel, to see this, to see that. I've lost those things. And you know what? Jesus is right there. And he says, you really have everything that you need. What's most important in your life you have. That's fulfillment in me. That's satisfaction in me. Uh, that is in my word, in a relationship with me, in, in fulfilling opportunities to make a difference for me. That's what this is all about. He says, you know what, when you look at people, look on them with compassion. Realize that every person you will ever, ever, ever encounter has needs that are so significant. And yet God wants to use you to help meet that need with grace and with the love of Christ. Most of all, we have to simply love Christ. If we're going to have any hope of, of loving like he would have us to, we have to love him. John chapter 15, there's a couple verses here I just want to mention. Jesus says, I have loved you, and so abide in my love. In other words, know me. Spend time with me. Know my heart. What's important to me. Embrace that. Bring that into your life. Value those values in your life. Let it change you. That's the only thing that can change us is when we put our eyes on Christ and say, Lord, I want to be like you. Well, what you did for me, no one has ever done that for me. I want to be like you. I want to live for you. John 15, 9. Abide in my love. Know him. He says in verse 7, if we're going to know Christ, we have to be in his word. We have to read his word. Uh, his will is revealed in this word. And my word shall abide in you. That's this right here. Not just his spoken words while he was here in those three years, but the written word that he gave to us. He says if we're going to love people, that will only happen if the word of God is being transferred into my heart, into my life, and it's becoming a, it's becoming a part of my, my spiritual DNA. That transforms my ability to look on people with grace and love. And then he reminds us, without me you can do nothing. 
that's really encouraging because when I yield to the Lord, when, when you yield to the Lord, uh, we can do anything. We can love in the most difficult of situations. Uh, we can show grace no matter what the offense to us. We can see others and treat others as Christ treated us. I pray, I pray that we just want that more than anything else. Let's go to this chapter. This is so familiar, but it's so relevant in this, in this passage we're at. 1 Corinthians 13. I want us just to turn there. I want us to... to uh, I'm just going to read a few of the verses, and uh, let's, let's look at this together, shall we? Okay? Okay, 1 Corinthians 13. Okay, let's go here. So in 1 Corinthians 13, in verse 1, we see these words. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging, clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all that I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Those, those are really powerful words. This person and these people who are being described in here are us. But if we came across somebody who was living like this, who was filled with the ability to prophesy or filled with, with a faith that can move mountains, uh, filled with, with the, uh, the ability to, uh, um, everything that I have is yours, it's not important to me, I, I give up all that I have, uh, I give it away, uh, even a willingness to give up their own body. Jesus says those things are great. However, if any of those things and all of those things and things like that, if we serve and we, and we do good works, but we don't exhibit the love of Christ, we don't truly do it to really impact people towards the Lord, not towards us, towards the Lord. If we don't do what we do so that people will see Christ, Jesus says we have nullified the work that he wants to do through us. The great things that we might do, uh, the tasks, the jobs that we might do at church, in the community, in our family, at home. If we do good things, those are all important. The reason good works can't save me is when I go to stand before the Lord, all those good works are tainted because of sin. When I'm saved, Jesus forgives me for all those sins. I am now pure and righteous before him. But as a child of God, if I serve him and I do it with a heart it's not loving towards others and loving towards him, I have, I have already gotten my reward. And I have hurt others that I'm serving. Uh, I have manipulated them instead of serving them. Instead of showing humility and grace towards them, I have used them towards an end that is mine, not the Lord's. When we truly love others, in humility we serve them for their good and to draw them to Christ. When we serve, it's not about us. It's about drawing others to Christ. And then he says here in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4, let's just think about Jesus as we read these words. Jesus is patient. Wasn't he patient? Jesus is kind in every way. Jesus does not envy. He never envied anything or anyone. He never boasted. When anyone could boast, it's him. He never boasted. In humility, he served all of us. He was never arrogant, never proud, uh, never self-righteous when he was the most righteous person who ever lived. He was never rude. He always spoke the truth pointedly. Uh, he spoke to the need of individuals. He never shied away from that, but he was never rude. He never insisted on his own way. You, you understand that everything that Jesus did, he did it for the Father. He spoke the Father's words and the Father's way and the Father's timetable. It never was his, it was his Father's. He never insisted on his own way. That gets in, that gets in front of us so many times. We do things and we have to do it our own way. Jesus was never irritable. He wasn't, uh, he wasn't e easily angered. He didn't have a trigger. He wasn't resentful. Uh, the Greek there says um, uh, not to reason the bad. He didn't dwell upon the bad things. He didn't become resentful because of bad things that had been done against him. Uh, that wasn't his heart. In fact, he loved us. Uh, Jesus never rejoiced at wrongdoing. He was spotless, sinless, undefiled. He always rejoiced with the truth. He proclaimed the truth, lived the truth, and died that the truth might change our lives. He bore all things. Um, he bore our burdens. 
the infirmities of the people all around him, his disciples, he bore those. He believed in all things. Um, his faith in, in the mission given to him by his father, what it would accomplish, the significance of it. Uh, he hoped all things. He never lost sight of the end. Uh, what his mission is going to the cross and yet rising again, what it would accomplish for all of us uh, and bring honor and glory to him. He never lost sight of that. And he endured all things. Rebuke and hatred and uh, blasphemy against him, all these things. Um, we need to look at, at this chapter and say, am I loving others like this? The third, the third element in, in this chapter 13 of John is, is we're to reflect his heart. Uh, if we're going to love, we're going to do that because we are reflecting the heart of the Lord. John 13 verse 35 says this, By this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. You know, there's no other marker, there's no other uh, qualifying fact, there's nothing that shows Christians to be Christians more clearly than when we simply love others biblically. You know, People might think, well, you're a Christian because you go to church. Christian because you don't do this. You don't do that. You're a Christian because uh, you're kind. You're a Christian because uh, you give to the poor. You're a Christian because whatever. But you know what? The Bible says the greatest indicator, the greatest, the most strongest, the most powerful mark of any Christian, the one that stands out above everything else, is this, that we supernaturally, divinely, Love people around us like Jesus does. In fact, at the end of this verse, you are my disciples if you have love for one another. That word have is echo in the Greek. It's not translated in, in all the translations. But it's so important because we can't, we can't give out to others. We can't show others. We can't model to others what we don't have in our own heart. If Jesus hasn't truly changed you, if you don't love him with all your heart and soul and mind, if your desire is to walk with the Lord and, and be his first, if that's not my desire, it won't come out of my life. If I don't truly love people or even like people in my life, I'll never love them like Christ would have us to do. If I haven't been transformed by the, by the forgiveness of Christ, if I haven't been totally changed by his utter love to me in my life, and that he loves me when I didn't deserve it, and in that love he's given me everything, that I could ever want. He's given me every blessing that is beyond comprehension in words. If I haven't received that love, a love, a love that has changed me even though I have failed so much and didn't deserve any grace, if I haven't received that and understand that, I can't give that out. Our greatest power in our testimony is the fact that Jesus loved us and because he loved me where I was at, when I was weak, when I was an enemy, when I was a sinner, because he did that for me, then I am obligated to love everyone that Jesus brings across my path. I am obligated to love them like Christ would. Uh -huh. I may hate the sin that's in their life, but I am obligated to love them and to love them with this passion because he had first loved me. Um, so if that is not in my heart, our first prayer is, Lord, Lord, I need you as Savior, or Lord, I need to yield my heart to you. There are attitudes, there are thoughts in my heart towards others. There's no place for them to belong in the heart of a child of God. We can lay that before the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5.17, If anyone's in Christ, he is, he is a new creation. The old has passed and the new has come. It's transformation. 2 Corinthians 3.18, And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. You know, we have an unveiled face. That's speaking of Moses when he would come down from the mountains being with God and the glory of the Lord would shine on his face and he would have to cover it because the people were afraid to look at him and he was embarrassed that the glory would start to fade after a time. This is saying, you know what? We have the opportunity to see the Lord face to face every day. And, and the result of that is that that relationship with the Lord 
is then transferred through everything that I do. And people see the glory and the love of Christ in my life. It's unmistakable. They look at our life and say, God is there. God is showing me something through that person I have never seen before. It is a love of Christ. One step at a time, we are being transformed to be able to love like this. In fact, Romans tells us how. Hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. He uses the Word of God in our life. The Holy Spirit takes that Word and it just, it just transforms us. The more we are immersed in the Word of God, the more we change. The more the Word of God gets immersed into our life and into our heart, the more it changes me. I just, I cannot be the same person when I let the Word of God change me. I cannot view other people the same way when the grace and love of God changes my heart towards them. I can't. Hope does not put us to shame. You know, when we as Christians, you know, there's, there's just a, there's a testimony of, of Christians who claim to be Christians, who, who do things in the name of Christ, and yet they're, they're only self-serving. When we serve others and do things simply for ourselves, we hurt the cause of Christ. We hurt the testimony of showing the love of Christ. God is not honored in that. People are hurt by that. They are turned off from Christ, from Christianity, from the church, because, because the love they have received isn't genuine. It's, it's manipulative. When we love like Christ loved us, it's authentic. It is genuine. Um, it is faithful to the Lord's heart. And so the Lord gives us the ability to minister to people no matter what's in their heart, no matter where they're at, because through the Holy Spirit and His Word, through communion with Him, He gives us the ability to, to see into their life and love them anyways, and to show them the grace and love of Christ that He offers. You know, that's the good news. John's about the Gospel. It's about good news. That's good news. Isn't it, folks? That's just good news. Uh, everything that we do is to be done to honor the Lord, uh, to show His love, and ultimately to reflect His heart. Jesus, as He loved His disciples here, to the very end, this is the kind of love he showed them, and he says, and he shows to us. He wants us to embrace this same love. He wants us to be committed to this. Lord, transform our hearts. Transform, break down our will, and turn our will towards the Word of God and towards Christ. Because it's the will that has to change. May we be people who are willing to be changed. Lord, change me. Christ, change me so that I look like you more today and more tomorrow than I did yesterday. May the Lord help us to that end. We're praying for you. We love you. Uh, we miss you. I wish you were here. Talking to the camera is great. It's so much better to be with you as a family of God. And I can't wait to hear what we're going to be able to share. But maybe we'll be able to share this. Ways that God has helped us to love each other at home and the people in our lives as we've gone through these weeks. May he bless you with that testimony and that story. We'll see you next week. Lord bless.